Welcome to our mini lecture on predictive models. We want to give you a brief introduction what predictive models are, how you can obtain predictive models and uh, assess their quality and what are the problems that you need to face in order to obtain predictive models of high quality. The general idea of predictive models uh, to be used in uh, health or personalized health especially is that you have some patient data and you can apply some machine learning algorithms um, or AI as many people call it uh, nowadays as well. Uh, and from there you get predictive models that you can then use um, to assess uh, specific patient data, for instance, to have risk assessments, intervention suggestions, etc. So what actually is a predictive model? Um, a predictive model is a function, and here it's function in the mathematical or engineering sense as a mathematical function or a software algorithm that is approximating an observable correlations between the input variables of your domain and uh, some given target variable. Um, examples could be uh, very simplistic, but that you have a data set uh, um, containing the information that you have latitudes of positions on Earth and the average daily temperatures, and you could train a model that, uh, given the latitude uh, of some geographic position, is giving you the average daily temperature. Or uh, another one could be the size of a flat, uh, and the rental costs that uh, should be predicted from some database containing sizes of flats and uh, the rents. Or more classically from image areas, you have images and you have different pixels, so the different points in the image. And uh, from there you want, for instance, to detect if there is a street sign or and especially which street sign, so a stop sign or something like this. Um, this is typically what you um, help annotating or producing in this I'm not a robot quizzes. So the target variables can be of two different kinds in general. It can, can be numeric values like, uh, for instance, a quality of life score. Um, it could be the number of exacerbations per year. This is close to what we're going or will be doing in the project. It could be the temperature, as in the example above, or the rental costs. Or it could be a categorical category prediction. It could be from diagnostics, from uh, CT. It could be the presence, yes or no, of a tumor. Uh, it could be a disease phenotype. Um, it could be a street sign uh, as a result, uh, and so on. So this is what a predictive model is actually doing. And uh, um, especially mentioned that it is approximating the observation because it's not exactly just giving back the specific data on which it has been observing these different correlations and we'll be coming back to this. So how is the predictive model built? Uh, first you need the training data. The training data must of course include the target variables that is of interest. Um, we have here on the right we we'll have a very simple example uh, where the target variable could be the blood pressure. And of course, the, the training data must include the input variables uh, that uh, you think or you expect to be related to that target variable, or at least uh, that are, have an influence on this. So this here, we have the age and blood pressure, and the, the red bullet points are the, the training data that we use to train the model. And uh, the predictive model, of course, can only detect correlations or approximate correlations of variables that are given in the training data. So if some target variable is not uh, in the data set and you want to have a predictive model for this, then you can uh, only uh, obtain it if it's really in the data. And if it's not there, it cannot be predicted. So. The next step to build a predictive model after you have the training data is to need to determine which machine learning algorithms you want to use. 
And there are different machine learning algorithms and the choice really depends on the use case. And there is no, in general, no a priori best algorithm for every use case. There are very simple machine learning algorithms like linear regressions. That's what we have here on the top left. We have more complex ones uh, with growing complexity um, up down to the deep neural networks at the bottom line, the convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. Um, the complexity of the algorithms uh, correlate with the complexity of the correlations they can learn uh, that, uh, that is contained in the training data. And as a general rule of thumb, when you have a simple algorithm, you can only construct uh, simple models or detect simple models and correlations. Uh, if you have more complex one, you need uh, to take the more complex algorithms, but you need more, in general, much more training data uh, in order to have an effective training because you have much more um, information to learn from the training data. So we stick here in the example that we have started with and we also took a very, or the similar, one of the simplest uh, um, models uh, or machine learning algorithms, which is linear regression. So you can only learn linear relationships between input variables and output variables. So it can only, that's why we have this black line here, um, which is representing this linear correlation between the input variable of age and the target variable blood pressure. So the machine learning algorithm is applied to the training data and applying it is what in general or very often is called fitting uh, it to the training data. And as a result of this fitting process, we obtain the predictive model that is represented by this black line. So what are we doing with that model? We do want to do predictions. And for the predictions, there are two things to tell. So whenever we give um, some input variable on the horizontal age uh, axis, it will give us the corresponding blood pressure that uh, you can read out of these correlations in the model. So when you, the, the advantage of this model is that you can obtain predictions for uh, variables which were not present in the input variables uh, the, uh, at the first, in the first place. Uh, so this is for instance for point A where um, there was no training data but the model gives you some estimation or approximation of what it believes the blood pressure for this age uh, is. The other thing to mention is that on those training data uh, it has been training on, it's not necessarily turning the exact values of uh, in the training data, but there might be deviations from that. So this is the, for instance, the example of point B, where we have this uh, training data, which is the uh, red star below the line, below the B, um, but the actual prediction that is produced by the model on that data that it should in principle know is slightly different. It's above the real data that is stored in the uh, training data. So this, are, this is how the predictions are and how, what they are in general, the, the outcomes are. So what's now the quality of a model? Um, to, to, or to obtain a model and to assess the quality of a model, um, the whole data is split in two parts. It's split in a training data set. These are the um, red uh, stars here and testing data, which are the blue stars. So first we apply the fitting process of our machine learning algorithms on the training data. And then we try to make that as close as possible to the training data, uh, which is the fitting process. And then we take the model and see how well it approximates the test data set we have, which has not been present in the training data set. 
And then we access, assess the approximation errors on the testing data and this approximation indicates the quality of our trained predictive model. In general, the smaller the approximation error is, the better the model is. But there's not only a single metric in general that you need to consider, uh, but you need to consider different metrics. So you can have accuracy, precision, or something like the F1 score uh, in order to uh, assess the quality of your model. Um, here's an example. Uh, on the left, we still have this linear model, um, which is a simple model. But as you can see, it's not very close to all the different points of our uh, test data set, the blue points. So it has, uh, well, it has some quality, but maybe not that high quality. And on the right, we have a different model, which is this curved uh, black line, which is uh, well, something like a polynomial function. Uh, and that is coming much closer to all the test points that we have in the test data set. But of course, to learn a, a polynomial function is much more complicated than to learn a linear function. And that's why this is a much more complex task. And this is just to make the difference uh, clear at this point. And of course, if you go to more, even more complex models of one of those we have seen earlier in the slides, um, then the, the process gets uh, much more complicated. So what kind of problems can occur? First, um, the data that we use uh, or that is used for training um, is biased. So this is uh, classically, for instance, known for um, predictive models that should do a pre-selection of job applications, sorting out uh, probably unsuccessful or uninteresting uh, job applications. Um, if that is trained on uh, a biased training data set that contain previously successful and unsuccessful job applications, and for whatever reason, there are specific groups of persons that were just underrepresented uh, in that uh, data because not they, they were just not many applying for a job, then um, during the training, the influence of uh, these groups is outweighed by the uh, other group of people and hence some uh, the model is just replicating this uh, statistical underrepresentation in the predictions. The next example would be opinion polls. If you want to do opinion polls, of course, you uh, need a representative data sets uh, of your population. So if this is not uh, done, then of course, the results of your opinion polls are uh, not useful, but it's the similar uh, problem. And of course, this is known for di in different parts of uh, uh, the health domain as well, where we have only uh, drugs tested on uh, non-representative uh, population subsets and uh, something alike. The other one is that we have a wrong choice of input variables that we feed into the uh, uh, training algorithms um, so that we have just selected the wrong ones or not sufficiently ones uh, and from those uh, we cannot explain uh, in, or find a good correlation um, between the values of the input variables and the target variables. And um, uh, some of the target input variables are known uh, in, uh, in the medical domain and in other domains as well, of course. But um, we, for those parts where we uh, want to explore new uh, correlations and have predictions of target variables from input, input variables, we uh, want to, or we should consider more input variables. And that's why in the resample project, we have these two phases that we first want to collect as many input variables as possible uh, in order to not leave out possibly relevant uh, input variables that uh, are helping to uh, explain or train predictive models uh, that are good 
for the target variables that we're going to consider. Another one is that um, variables that are in the uh, data set, um, this can be both input variables as well as target variables, even though they have the same name and they may have the same values, the methods how they have been obtained are different. Um, one example could be that different hospitals have uh, measure uh, blood pressure uh, in a different way, but it's only reported uh, as a blood pressure value. And then although it's the same variable with the same uh, um, values, in principle, they somehow mean different things. So also here the procedure, how the values of the different uh, variables are obtained should be standardized. So this essentially means that um, the whole process uh, of uh, curating, preparing the data, cleaning the data, selecting the right uh, variables uh, is uh, a very tedious and a very crucial process uh, that needs to be done before any machine learning algorithm is actually applied. Uh, and this, that's a major effort, and but cr very crucial in order to obtain um, predictive models that in the end have a high quality. So what is then the next step when we have a predictive model and we want to put it into, well, medical use um, as foreseen, for instance, in the sample? Well, a predictive model is just providing some prediction but it's not giving you any information why it's giving that prediction. And so one crucial thing is to be able to generate or obtain some kind of explanations for the predictions made by the model and to provide this. So this is another crucial thing we want to consider in the project that we're not going to, to talk about here, but maybe in a later lecture. The next thing is, as we have seen, the models have a quality, but the quality is measured on the training data. And that's a different thing uh, uh, than the statistical validation that are typically used in the medical domain. Um, so the next thing we also want to do is to look into how we can, based on the data we have, uh, how we can validate the models in the medical uh, domain uh, using the appropriate statistical methods. And finally, um, what are we going to do with these models uh, beyond just giving the predictions? Uh, well, we can use the models to do simulations, for instance. We can vary, um, use the models since they give uh, results for all input uh, variable values. We can uh, play with these input variable values. We can do hypothetical um, uh, predictions. If some treatment, for instance, is given, what would be the effect and so on. So this is uh, then very useful, for instance, uh, using the simulations um, to maybe identify what best treatments could be for a specific person. These are all topics that we don't want to talk about here. Um, this was just a brief uh, introduction, uh, hopefully useful to everybody, um, what predictive models are and how you can obtain them and what the problems are. So um, we thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to answer questions um, at the meeting next week. Thank you. <laughs>